Um, and uh, again, tried to move through a little bit quickly with this talk. Um, really want to hear from uh, some of our panelists here, um, some of their considerations, because um, as you'll see, this is something that I feel like um, can be unavoidable. Um, but I think with appropriate optimization, uh, we can minimize the chances and uh, really try to make this less of an impact on our, on our patient population. Um, so again, um, really talking about risk factors, you know, there, there are some methods for uh, mitigating risk and then, you know, possible advantages to opti optimize patient outcomes. I think those are things we should all be doing as deformity surgeons. So, um, you know, proximal junctional kyphosis is uh, defined as a 10 degree change uh, relative to the preoperative angle when we're looking at our upper, inter uh, upper instrumented vertebra as the UIV, and then UIV plus two would be the upper instrumented vertebra to higher. Um, and then, you know, at what point does that become a proximal junctional failure? I think that's, we're going from a radiographic diagnosis to a clinical diagnosis. And obviously, um, you know, if someone comes in with uh, a protrusion of the rod through the skin or a neurologic deficit, that's very clear. Uh, but sometimes it can be a lot more subtle where, you know, someone may have noticed a progression over time. Uh, you know, they're bothered by their posture or, um, you know, really just um, you know, noticing that their, their sagittal position in space is off, um, and that's a slow process over time. So um, when it requires a, um, additional surgery is when we you know, go from uh, proximal kyphosis to proximal failure. And a lot of these concepts can be applied to distal junctional failure. We haven't talked much about uh, cervical thoracic deformity in uh, this, these talks today, but um, all of these apply to our uh, longer construct in the cervical thoracic spine as well. So, um, you know, multiple risk factors for patients. These are all things that we want to, um, you know, Keep in mind when we're having preoperative discussions with patients, you know, looking at uh, bone density as we talked about earlier. Um, just one of the, uh, the slide here shows us how we should be uh, appropriately measuring it. You know, any bone islands in that ROI circle that we're measuring are going to throw it off. And so you can use a sagittal um, as it kind of also works as well. Um, you know, most this, mostly this. Uh, data is based on the L1 vertebral body. So when we look at these Hounsfield units being below 100, uh, that applies to the L1 vertebral body in the cross section. Um, you will see higher numbers in the thoracic spine. Um, so just because a thoracic vertebra is over 100, you know, that we typically will see those higher in terms of normalization. So just keep that, keeping that in mind. Um, but a lot of times DEXA scan will um, overestimate the actual bone density. You know, they may have have osteophytes that are uh, showing up as dense bone, whereas the actual uh, cancellous bone there, excuse me, is pretty poor quality. And, and the Hounsfield units are a tool to really uh, prevent us from being um, confused by an inappropriate DEXA scan. Sarcopenia, I think, is another big factor uh, that is a modifiable one. Um, you know, there's a meta-analysis for that by Wu a few years back, looked at 14 studies. Um, and, you know, some studies have shown this to be a very strong predictor of uh, proximal junctional failure or revision surgery. Um, other studies have thought, uh, used factors like, um, you know, frailty index and thought that that's more uh, predictive. Uh, but I think if you see a very low uh, muscle density that reflects the uh, muscle density above your construct and with someone with low muscle density, you can really focus on prehabilitation, building up their um, physical strength and possibly mitigate that. Again, I don't know that there's any true data to um, say that this is a predictive factor, but and, and one of the reasons I believe that is because there's so many of these factors that are tied together that it's hard to say just one is the true predictive factor versus another. 
you know, we always uh, talk very detail about alignment because I think this is probably one, if not the most important factors. Um, you know, the um, holy grail of PIL mismatches, kind of what we in initially thought of. We talked about Rusali um, and, you know, pelvic incidents, um, also very important. And, you know, I think as we understand this better, um, whether you believe in age match, um, uh, Alignment, and again, I think we don't have a perfect understanding of which patient needs uh, how aggressive of correction, um, but clearly if we are um, undercorrecting or overcorrecting patients, um, you know, there is going to be a, a higher risk for proximal junctional failure. So you can see in this patient an undercorrection is really putting a lot of stress at that proximal junction requiring revision and extension higher. Uh, similarly, an overcorrection here uh, with a very aggressive PSO um, is really going to make that uh, proximal level just uh, far too much stress and uh, is also a risk factor for proximal junctional failure. So in terms of preoperative planning and alignment, I think um, that's one of the main things we can do to, to decrease that risk. Um, Kypho and vertebroplasty um, also described in some studies as being helpful. Um, you know, tethers and hooks, um, soft tissue disruption. And then we talked about variable diameter rods earlier in the morning as a, uh, you know, a possible emerging uh, tool for, you know, softening that landing. Um, you know, this was a study that looked at, um, you know, vertebroplasty for preventing proximal functional failure. Um, again, in and of itself, some studies have shown a modest benefit. Um, I think if you have a, a patient who has already failed and um, you know is going to need a revision surgery and um, has all these risk factors, this is something that you can use. Um, one of the things to be aware of is cement extravasation. You know, this is one of my cases. We had a very small breach, um, but did have that extravasation into the anterior aspect of the cord. Um, and this is a very nerve wracking CT to look at. So, um, you know, always want to be very careful as you're placing these um, screws, as you're, whether you're using a kyphoplasty technique or a fenestrated screw, there's always the chance of the cement extravasation. So, you know, using these selectively in the, the patients that you've really feel like need that extra benefit. Um, these are a, a few different um, versions of tethers and um, hooks as well. Um, you know, looking at E and F on those panels, those are sublaminar hooks and uh, TP hooks. Uh, looking at um, that G panel, that's the UIV and UIV plus one using cement augmentation. And then there are multiple described techniques, whether it's sublaminar wires, um, using a tether through that transition from the spinous process to the lamina um, or a combination of both to try to soften that landing and make the transition from the very rigid rod to the uh, flexible spine a little bit less dramatic um, may also uh, prove benefit. And, um, you know, in the, um, you know, ISSG data, they did find that there was a, a, a clinical um, difference in, in using a hook or not. You know, I think the combination, again, of alignment with some of these to just um, try to fight against some of those uh, factors that may be the host that you can't control um, can definitely be beneficial. And again, uh, just, this is just a, a um, image showing that if you do have a failure, even with proximal hooks, those can fail. And uh, to be aware of that soft tissue envelope at the cephalad aspect, um, something you know you may need to, even if that is not coming out through the skin, it could be an impending problem. Um, and you do want to get ahead of that before uh, someone has a, a kind of catastrophic wound breakdown. Um, this is looking at um, the use of MIS versus open. Um, and uh, these were adult deformity patients using uh, anterior column reconstruction and comparing the open posterior uh, versus um, doing percutaneous screws posteriorly. Um, and they did find double the revision rate for PJK in this, time, in this study. Um, you know, the outcome measures were fairly similar in looking at their um, patient reported uh, studies. But, um, you know, is this, again, how, how much 
care are you taking to uh, reduce that soft tissue damage at the proximal aspect of your um, dissection, I think is very important. Even if you're not going to do percutaneous screws and leave it 100% intact, you know, making sure that you're leaving your, your ligaments as much as intact as possible and minimal muscle disruption, I think can also uh, lead to minimizing the risk of proximal junctional kyphosis or failure. And I uh, just wanted to finish with a patient here. Um, you know, this is a very typical patient that we may see in our clinic. Um, you know, uh, try to get the patient optimized. Uh, she comes back three months later. Uh, she's absolutely miserable in terms of her pain and um, difficulty ambulating because of her posture. Um, she does have osteoporosis in the hip. She's got osteopenia. Um, and then, you know, I, I think one of the most challenging thing about, things about these cases is how to have that discussion with the patient, um, you know, if someone is truly disabled by their spinal deformity um, and you're not able to get them appropriately optimized, um, having that discussion is to, you know, yes, you have a surgical deformity, but I don't think that um, you're going to do well with surgery, I think is one of the more challenging things that we face. Um, and we'd just love to hear from you guys kind of what do you um, put into place to try to mitigate these, these things that a lot of times are, are not out of our controls as surgeons. So I'll start with you, Dr. Lewis. So this patient comes in, uh, very, very poor health. Um, and, you know, what, what are the conversations that you're going to have with her? Uh, yeah, I think patient selection uh, is one of the most important factors for outcome. And, and uh, you know, as surgeons, we want to fix everybody. And, and there are people we just can't fix. And I think uh, part of the discussion is, to, you know, the number one treatment for most of these patients is a walker. And uh, I usually encourage them uh, to work on that. Uh, I think the other thing that we also have to consider is their social function and, and what kind of backup they have at home. You know, taking someone who's alone, lives alone, and, and putting them through a big surgery, they're probably not going to be in a position to, to recover appropriately. So I think there's a, there are a lot of patient factors, but... Uh, these are uh, big decisions, and you have to really consider all the factors. I agree with you, and uh, surgery, uh, unfortunately, not the answer for everybody. I agree. One of the things that I know uh, Jens and I are fans of is, you know, the recumbent bicycle and aquatic therapy. Um, you know, people sometimes will argue that they can't exercise because they're in so much pain. I know um, those are big things that we've found um, in our practices to be effective in terms of uh, activating people. Um, any other thoughts on bone density? Um, what do you guys have as uh, kind of uh, treatment algorithms? You know, that we have this kind of three-month um, window that we're supposed to, you know, have a minimum of three months. I think that was kind of plucked out of the air. Um, so would love to hear any thoughts on, on optimizing bone health. Yeah, Amir, uh, we're lucky to have an uh, endocrinologist who specializes in bone health immediately available at our facility. And so this conversation in regards to, to frailty in the bones is reasonably easy for us. I'll consult that person to our bone health specialist, and uh, they're very good at getting uh, uh, bone agonist agents on board if necessary. I agree with you. I think the three months was somewhat plucked out of the air. And if uh, a patient is, is reasonably desperate, and I think that they're going to be a reasonable surgical candidate if we can just get their bone to the appropriate density, then as long as they've started bone anabolic agents, typically I'll, I'll get them booked and we'll go down that surgical route. But I do like to keep it on for about a year perioperatively and then make sure that they continue follow up with the bone health endocrinologist to uh, determine treatment uh, in the future. And I tell them that they've got a chronic disease just like any other chronic disease, and it's a bone health related chronic disease that they need to stay on top of. Great. Very wise words. Thank you. We're trying to do at least six months pre-op at our center, but uh, that also matches up really well with our wait times. So if patients are waiting that long anyway, we find that it's, uh, that it's effective. Um, it also gives them time to go through kind of opiate reduction and uh, acceptance commitment therapy and things like that, which we found have also been pretty beneficial pre-op. Yeah, I'm, I'm fairly regularly um, getting a CT scan. Let's get you a... Agents, you have people that are not responders. So, uh, so I was saying that I, I pretty regularly, and it's funny, in my system, 
to get a second uh, DEXA scan within two years is like a near impossibility. But for whatever reason, they, they will approve a CT scan willy-nilly. You know, getting an MRI can be tough, but getting a CT scan for me seems to be nobody ever questions it. So I usually will go, and again, depending on where we're starting off with, you get somebody that's really osteoporotic with, you know, people in the Houndsville units in the 60s to 80s range, I'm just gonna tell it's not gonna respond enough. So I'll, I'll treat them for six months and then get a CT scan. Uh, and then I'll see where they are. And, you know, I was actually, was, you know, just because of the mechanism of action, I was a little bit, uh, a little bit skeptical that a vanity would have a, have a substantial effect. I, you know, I thought that, you know, the, the parathyroid uh, hormone analogs would be more effective, but I've been very impressed with the vanity for a majority of people in improving their bone density fairly substantially. So what I do is I go and I bring them back, and the nice thing is for the majority of patients, there'll be improvement. So let's say it's gone from 80 to 110. I said, look, if you've, you've made improvement, you know, and this is a matter of us benefiting, uh, you know, a balancing risk and benefit. So I said, you know, ideally I'd like to have it above 130, but, you know, the fact is that, that means you're going to have to have to wait longer uh, to do that. And I said, I, I don't know exactly how long it'll be. So if they're on it, I'll bring them back again in another, you know, four to six months if they're willing to wait and then uh, then continue the treatment. And I would, you know, ideally, I like them to continue the treatment for a year after uh, the, uh, w whenever I'm pulling the trigger to go do this. And despite that, I still get, you know, I still get uh, episodes of PJK. So I was gonna, the second thing I was gonna ask is, you know, to me, at the thracolumbar junction, that almost always seems to be, seems to be a bone quality issue. But I pretty regularly was tethering people to go to the UIV plus two. And so when I was ending, which I typically do for the upper thoracic levels, I would end at T4. And I've had four now people that are in the, in, in the, in the two to five year period of time that I tethered them to T, to, uh, I ended my construct at T4, tethered up to T2. And I've now had either four or five people in that three to five year period of time who have now subluxed at T12. Mm. So I do think that, that the upper thoracic spine is probably more of a ligamentous complex disruption problem. And that basically when I went in to revise them, you know, there, there was, you know, it did look like the fusion had extended up a little bit, or at least there was dense scar tissue, or maybe the tethers are too, are too stiff, you know, the polyethylene tethers that you're actually fusing it. Now, it's not immediate, you know, it's, uh, you know, it has stopped the, you know, the people that, you know, that are three weeks after surgery, you know, having something catastrophic happen. But I think even with what we're doing now, at least what I, the way I did it, I've made that that construct too stiff in, in getting you know this T12 problem that's occurred. So this is you know it's a very very complex issue, but I do think that your emphasis, I think the overall conditioning and prehabilitation and the the soft tissue envelope, I think are 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 very uh, are very important in, in in addition to increasing the bone health. Great, thank you all so much. Uh, I think that can be a new one of our uh, AI tools is to uh, look at all these factors and predict who gets surgery and who doesn't. So you heard it here first. All right, um, let's see, who do we have next? We got Alekos in the lab. 